Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I'm going to be doing some heat shielding on my 400 horsepower stick shift go-kart over here. And I figured this might be a good opportunity for me to share a few things with you guys regarding heat shielding and best practices. A little, we're going to talk a little bit about thermal heat conduction and so forth. Now, for those of you that have seen this project before, you understand that I've got my exhaust and my turbo right behind the fuel cell here. In fact, the fuel cell sits right on here. It's mounted on these brackets and the exhaust system goes right underneath that fuel cell. We've got the turbo manifold, and then we've got the, the dump pipe. Now, of course, all of this is gonna produce a lot of heat, a lot of radiation heat coming off the back of the exhaust system. It's wrapped with a titanium heat material on the hot side of the turbo, as well as the exhaust but it's just not doing quite good enough. So we need to manage this heat situation a little bit better than we currently are. So any material that has the highest thermal conduction properties is gonna be the best used in things for heat shielding. Examples of that are going to be materials like copper and aluminum. What I've got here, this is a really thin piece of corrugated aluminum. That's kind of how that's going to go in there, and then my fuel cell is going to sit right behind us. There are aluminum-based materials out there with like a peel and stick that you can actually secure to the back of your fuel cell. In my opinion, this material would be best used in things like a firewall and engine compartment where you've got an air gap. If I were to take a sticky adhesive heat shielding and were to just line my entire fuel cell, well, not maybe the whole fuel cell, but if I were to line the bottom of the fuel cell and the back of the fuel cell, would that be effective? Yes, it would be more effective than using nothing at all right now. However, the best performance that we can get out of the system is if we use an aluminum reflective material like this corrugated material I have, and we create an air gap. So I do have this in the shape that I would like it to be, but we do need to build a frame for this material. Before I get my frame fully assembled, I just want to show you all I've done is I've put one hole in the frame here, one hole in the frame there. That's going to get riveted. This is just a double side tape. And I wasn't really sure if that was going to have a good stick to it, but it sure does. Let me get this thing riveted up and then we'll get it installed. Just to give myself a bit more peace of mind, I did add this back frame around here. You can see we're all riveted together. I've got a thin little piece of double side sticky tape wherever the frame mounts to the actual heat shield. I think it looks pretty good. I mean, it wasn't sturdy before, but this frame really made a big difference. Gosh, I definitely should have emptied this fuel cell. I'm gonna have to take off just a bit more material from this corner so I can secure the tabs on the tank down to the frame. So it is in place. Now, the actual heat shielding and the frame for the heat shielding and everything is not, it's not mounted to the machine itself. It's just underneath the tank here. And this is why I had to cut out, trim out that corner piece was for this tab here. Of course, what we wanna do for the best performance is create air gaps on this side and on this side whenever possible. A little bit less of a gap, but there is a gap underneath here. You can see it's not making contact with the bottom of the tank. That's because of the offset. Underneath, if you look closely, that is the far wall of my garage. So even though this material is bent up just a little bit, and it's minimizing that gap. There is a gap all the way around this thing. So that's it. That should keep our fuel tank a lot cooler. All right, so you guys didn't actually think I was gonna end the video there without showing you some real positive results. Fingers crossed positive results. I haven't tried this test before, so I don't know what to expect myself. Okay, so now that we've got our heat shielding in place, you can see the tank is being protected from the heat shielding. We're gonna fire up the thermal imager and we're gonna fire up the buggy and we're going to just record the process and we're gonna see how much heat builds up, how quickly.
So where the white target is there, that's what's taking this top temperature here, this 89 degrees. The maximum temperature is this little target over here. So that one's showing currently 246, 245. It's that middle temperature there. And then this is just a minimum temperature. The minimum temperature is scanning over here on the coldest side of the screen. But nonetheless, these are our results. Now the engine has been running for one hour, exactly. So we'll reset this. We're going to let the engine and everything get completely ice cold, right back to the same temperature is where we started. And then we're gonna remove our heat shield and then we'll run the same test and we'll see what kind of temperatures we get. So at this point, the engine has been sitting for about six hours. And for some reason, the stickers, these stickers actually are showing a few degrees warmer and I don't know why that is. The radiator is completely cold. See, now our max temperature is actually down to 78 degrees at this point. So even these areas underneath the buggy here are still only at 78 degrees, but I think that's close enough to not really skew our final results because remember, this machine is running for a solid hour with a very hot exhaust underneath it and a very hot turbo right behind it. I will run two cycles and that will put us at one hour of runtime and we'll take some temperatures. our one hour timer. One thing you'll notice is that where the crosshair is pointed does change and affect the temperature pretty dramatically. When it's on the sticker it's reading about 9900 degrees and then when I move the crosshair to the center of the tank we're getting about 76 degrees. The one thing I will point out is that when I ran the first test with the heat shielding the crosshair was almost directly on top of a sticker and we were reading a maximum of 8990 degrees. Without the heat shielding on top of this sticker, we're getting a 100 degree reading. But if anybody has any theories as to why those stickers would change the temperature dramatically on the surface of an aluminum tank, I'd love to hear them. So I'll be the first to say our thermal imaging test was a little bit inconclusive. In a nutshell, without getting into a long explanation, I just think that with the buggy just idling, there's just not enough of a heat source to really make a big difference one way or the other. The buggy ran for an hour both times just idling. When it's idling, there's really not a lot of heat that's coming off of the exhaust. So unfortunately, we're not gonna figure this one out without going out to the trails. The good news is, is I've got a, a new trail camera. So we'll bring this thing out on the trails. I'll get you guys some crispy footage on my brand new camera. And uh, then we'll see what temperature this fuel cell gets to. got the new heat shield in place and I've been riding very aggressively lots of boost as you could see there from the video I'm trying to tune my fuel table and I will say the fuel cell is considerably considerably cooler than it's been before normally after a couple of hard pulls like that is when the fuel cell starts getting warm it's probably like what it was in the garage it's probably 90 degrees 
Last time I was doing this, it was probably 130, 140, which I think is maybe why I've shortened the lifespan of some of, or my, my last fuel pump. I've only gone through one fuel pump. So I think that's probably why the life on that thing was shortened. But the fuel cell is definitely staying uh, cooler. 